We're going to look at just one verse as we finish off the year. In fact, every, um, every year, Google, and then there's another app that many of you might have on your phone called YouVersion Bible app. It's like the most downloaded app of all time. And they, um, they do a, uh, like a, like, what is the most searched for uh, Bible verse of the year? Every year they've been doing like a, they've been doing it for years now. So here, um, here's some of them. 2017, the verse was Joshua 1.9. Talks about being courageous, entering into the land, right? Uh, in 2018, the most searched for Bible verse was Jeremiah 29.11. He talks about, it's, right, you guys know Jeremiah 29, 11? You could look it up for fun if you want to. But it's, uh, you know, uh, that God has a plan for your life. It's an amazing plan. Yay, that was 2018. 2019, Philippians 4, 6, about the peace of God. And such a good verse, such an important verse. So what was it for 2020? It was Isaiah 41, 10. Let's read Isaiah 41, 10. This is the most searched for verse in, uh, or search, yeah, searched out verse of 2020. And it's this. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This was the verse, you know, this year when Google was like, you know, okay, what was it that people were searching for the most? The Bible and, and it was fear. I'm sure it's hard to imagine why people would be looking at fear this year, right? Everybody wanted to know about what does the Bible say about fear? And so what I thought we would do is we will finish our year looking at that verse. We're going to talk about Isaiah 41.10, and we're going to focus on fear. No, we're not going to focus on fear. We're going to focus on the topic of fear. Let's not focus on fear. But And then these are my three points. I want to make three points to you today, okay? For those of you that are note takers or just like to see things on screens, these are my three points that we're going to talk about. The natural disease of fear, the command that God gives against fear, and then finally, we're going to look at promises from God to overcome fear. The disease of fear, the command against fear, and the promises of God to overcome fear. It's really interesting in the Bible that before, before sin entered into the world, there was no fear. We never, we don't read about any, like try to imagine that there was a time in the history of the world when Adam and Eve existed on the planet, and there was zero fear in them. They weren't afraid of nature. They weren't afraid of animals. Who is not an animal? Or who does not like animals? Pets. Who does not like dogs? Any non? Oh, okay. Who does not like cats? There's many more of you. Who loves cats? Just so that I, okay. Weirdos. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, no, cats are great. Right? Um, imagine, though, you know, if you've ever been around, we got a puppy. Uh, my son got a puppy for, Christmas, well, kind of birthday Christmas, uh, a little English bulldog, and he's the cutest. His name is Potato. He's the cutest thing because we raise couch potatoes. That's our plan in life. So he's going to be our couch potato. And, and we had some people over who didn't, they're not really like dog people. You ever been around some, a dog that's around a non-dog person? Who does the dog want to be around? The non-dog person, right? If you love them, they're like, eh, boring. But if you don't, they will win you or you or not. But imagine living in a world when a lion wasn't a scary thing or a bear or any, any vicious animal. And there were no, imagine this, you ready? There were no predators on the planet save one. It was Satan. He was the only predator that exists on planet Earth before sin entered the world. And when sin entered into the world, fear entered into the world. In fact, let me read to you from Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. This is what happened after sin entered the world, and God came down from heaven and was wanting to walk with Adam and Eve in the garden. This was his norm, and he couldn't find them. And he said, hey, where are you? And, they, and Adam said this, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. There's so much to that verse, but I just want to focus on one thing. There had never been a moment in Adam's life when he was afraid until this moment. Because that's what happens, and, and, and you and I can't imagine a world without fear because we've never lived in one without fear. Our whole lives have been dictated by, in some way or another, by fear. 
Now, I know we're at church, Christians, right? We're not driven by fear. We're all driven by fear. Even if you personally won't, the, weren't, the world was driven by fear in 2020. There's no way around it. I mean, everything was fueled by fear this year. And we're a part of that. We're in that system. And maybe it has been a big issue for you. Maybe fear has been a big thing. And I hope to surprise you with what God has to say about fear. It's not as simple as just don't be afraid. There's a little bit more to it. Um, one day, the Bible tells us we will live in heaven with God and there will be no more fear. And that's often overlooked. We don't really think about a life without fear very much because, you know, it just sounds, oh, we're going to be in heaven. That's so great. But fear has such a hold upon our lives that it's going to be, it's almost impossible to try to create scenarios for you and me to understand what it would be like to not live with fear. And yet one day the Bible says we will be with God and there will be no more fear. Try to imagine today, I might, I'm going to mention a few different areas. This might not be yours. Maybe one is, maybe all of them. I don't know. Ready? The fear of failure. You don't have to raise your hand because you'd be afraid that nobody else did and then you failed. So don't, don't raise your hand. Fear of failure is crippling so many people. We're so paralyzed by the very thought that if I fail, what happens to me if I fail? What will people think of me if I try something and it doesn't work out? The fear of failure is a powerful fear. The fear of missing out in life. If I'm not there, if I'm not a part of it, you know, uh, are the way we, the way mainly older people now, it used to be younger people, now it's older people in social media, there's a big fear that occurs, fear of missing out. You got to be careful. Fear of loss. Here's a real one, fear of death. And for a lot of people in 2020, they lost somebody and or some, or some buddies. And that fear of like, what, what if it's me? I mean, 2020 has, the, the amount of fears that we have have just been magnified on unprecedented levels. Never before have we been more afraid. I mean, so I like to go out and I'll, I'll, go, I'll go running in our neighborhood and around, you know, and, and like, I mean, this one time, like early on, or like in the, kind of in the middle of this whole thing, I'm running, you know, and I can't, I don't have to wear a mask. I'm allowed to run and not be near anybody, but I swallowed a bug. It's already a bad thing. And then I just was like coughing like crazy. And friends, nobody likes to see somebody coughing out in public anymore. There's nothing more terrifying these days than a person who's not wearing a mask, sweaty and coughing, okay? It's like everybody's, <laughs> you know, and I wasn't near anybody, but I was like, it's a bug. And but nobody believed me. I was just... You know, we're afraid of so many. We don't want to get sick. You don't even want to get sick at all, let alone because what it could mean, not just around people, but, you know, a lot of people have died. It's a terrifying time. Fear of jobs being taken away and never coming back. Fear is at an unprecedented level. It's not a fake thing. It's very, very real. And what I want you to try to imagine is if just one of those fears were to be removed from your life, you would be a changed person. If you no longer, I'll just pick one. If you no longer feared failure, you would be a, we wouldn't even recognize you. You'd be so different. Because all of us, to certain degrees, are driven by the fears that are around us. And fear turns to anger real quick because we don't know what to do with our fears. And so we get, we're so scared and then we get angry. And fear is natural. But the solution to fear is not natural. The solution to fear is supernatural. And this is where we have a kind of a quandary or a dilemma. This is the difficulty. Is that, listen, we talk about bravery or courage as the opposite of fear. And that's true in kind of a small way. There's people out there who are strong people. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And they're brave and they're courageous. But there's only so far courage can get you. And really when we talk about courage, we're talking about Courage is not the absence of fear, right? It's the ability to work through your fears. But the fear is still there. What does it look like to no longer even have those fears? And here's my two suggestions. Number one, we'll never see that on this side of heaven. It's only when we're with the Lord we're really going to truly know what life is like apart from fear. But to overcome our fears today cannot be done in a natural way. You won't just beat it. 
It can only be done by the supernatural. And so God gives this command. It's kind of an invitation. We can call it a command, but it's more of an invitation. In Isaiah 41, verse 10, he says this, Fear not. And if it was that simple, we would have all been doing it for a long time. Right? I mean, and I've said this to you before. It's like when you've got a little kid and they're like super scared and you say, just don't be scared. That, is, that advice has never worked on anyone. You know, when you're terrified and somebody says, don't be terrified. Oh, okay, now I feel better. <laughs> Nobody ever, it's, it doesn't work because we're driven. And when somebody says, don't be scared, it makes me more scared. Like, why are you telling me not to be scared? Now I think I should be scared. Now you're telling me I should be scared and now you're making it worse for me. Fear not is the command that God gives. And the question is, why does God give the command fear not when fear is a natural part of our lives that you are not going to get away from? And the reason is this. God wants to do in you and me what we could not do in ourselves. Now, like I said, we're not going to beat fear on this side of heaven. We're gonna, we are going to wrestle through fears our whole lives. And the things that we're going to wrestle with, especially if you're a Christian, think of it like this. There's, yeah, we, we talk about how scary the world is and how dangerous and how dark and how many problems and how, you know, it's easy to do that. And there's a lot of things to be afraid of. But let me just be honest with you. And I've been a Christian for a pretty long time now. Some of you have been a Christian a pretty long time. Some of you are new Christians. Let me just let you in on something. Here it is. The, the person that scares me the most is me. I am, I am shocked at, I'm scared of how easy it is for me to choose the wrong things. I've been a Christian a long time, and yet I can still move into, the, into directions that are wrong for me, knowingly. I don't need a world to scare me. I can scare myself. How am I going, how do I deal with these fears, these real issues? And I want you to know something, and I've said this to you before, but it's so good to remind ourselves of this. When God asks you to do something, he will give you the power to do it. When Jesus invited Peter to walk on water, he gave Peter the ability to do it. When Jesus asked a man with a, a, a deformed hand to stretch it out, he then also gave him the power to do that. When God asks you to do something, he plans on giving you the power. Now, here's the thing about that. You'll never know unless you do it. You won't experience his power unless you trust him. And not just like, oh, I trust God. James says it so well. James says, even the demons believe. Everybody has, faith. oh, I believe, I believe God. It's completely and utterly irrelevant to believe God. It's only relevant when you put it into action. And so what then is the solution to our fears, it's trusting God. You'll never have enough strength to defeat fear. You'll never have enough courage to defeat fear. But what you can do is trust God. And when you trust God, when I trust God, then he gives me the power to do or to believe or to experience what I could never do in my own strength. And we're going to look more at that when we come to the end of this passage. But it's so important for you and I to understand this. Your weakness is not a deficit in your life. It could be a great strength when you realize you can't do this on your own and you need to trust God. It is not a bad day when you learn to trust God. It's a good day. It's a good day when we learn that we can't do these things on our own. Now, I want to focus on these promises that God gives to you and me and how we can overcome fear because God is very specific about how to overcome fear. And I want to start by reading uh, um, a, a sentence from, or a couple sentences from one of my favorite, he's a British preacher named Charles Spurgeon from the 1800s. He wrote this, and I'm going to put it up on the screen here. He wrote this about these verses that we just read, Isaiah 41.10. He said this, five times in this verse you get some form of the pronoun you. And five times you get the pronoun, I. Whatever there may be of you, there shall be as much of God. Whatever there may be of your weakness, there shall be as much of God's strength. 
Whatever there may be of your sin, there shall be as much of God's mercy to meet it all. In fact, let me read to you again from Isaiah 41, verse 10. I want you to see it. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you. And I want you to notice this. I'm going to add a sixth one here. With my righteous right hand. So my suggestion, as much as I love what Charles Spurgeon says about whenever, and I think it's so true, whenever there is a you, there's always an I of God. But notice, it's not five to five, it's five to six. And that's what the Bible tells us. Where your sin abounds, God's grace does more abound. As much as there is you and me, there will always be more of God in our lives. Why should we not fear Because as much as there is us in the process, there's more of God in our lives. There's more of God in the circumstances. There's more of God in the the scenario. Notice what he says there in verse 10. Fear not, and I'm going to look at each one of these fear nots. He says this, fear not for I am with you. A really practical way to deal with the fears that we all face is to trust and recognize the presence of God at that moment. Not Sunday morning right now, oh yeah, we know God is here. I'm talking about when you are in a moment of fear, when you are feeling that overwhelmed, when you're getting anxious, the Bible says, don't be afraid. Oh, that's easy. No, 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 no. No, God doesn't give little trite answers. He says this, I'm with you. God's presence changes the circumstance. Doesn't always fix it. But boy, oh boy, is it great to know that there's someone with you when you're going through a hard time. You know, most of us, when we, we, most of our fears come from the feeling of being alone. You know, if I were to step out and try this thing and it failed, I'm going to stand alone. I'm going to look dumb. I'm going to feel stupid. I could ruin this. I could hurt this situation or whatever it is. It's that feeling of I'm going to be alone. And and the Bible says this, don't be afraid because I'll be standing there with you. I'll be with you. Fear not, for I am with you. God's company, God's presence. Notice what he says. He says, don't be dismayed, for I am your God. The word dismayed is like the word, like we... I love this word, discombobulated, like to be, to be all, it's like, you know, if your kids were into Legos and they're just kind of all spread out or, you know, they make it and then they break it. It's just, it's dismayed. It's not connected. It's not working together. It's chaotic. It's, it's, it's not unified. God says this, don't feel all freaked out. Don't feel all discombobulated. Don't feel that way for I am your God. What that means to you and me practically is this. It means that you will always have what you need in this life and in the life to come. There's that old phrase, you know, you heard that phrase like, uh, you know, it, you don't need money to be happy, but it sure helps. You know? And it's true. It's, both of them are true. You don't need, it's like, you don't need money, you know, happiness won't bring money. And you're like, yeah, that's a poor person said that because this to feel better, right? We all want to have more money. It's a true statement, isn't it? But it's not always true, but it's a true statement. And it's true of this too. Here's the reality. You always have enough in God. Always. You are rich. You're rich. Now you're like, "Uh, my bank account doesn't say it. You will always, there's some things, and listen, hey, if money is the thing you want to get, go for it. Go have, go get more money if that's what you're after. But here's the truth. If what you're missing is a sense of peace in your life, the Lord would love to be the one to be able to give that to you. And, oh, I believe God. You got to step into that. You got to walk into that. If you want the water to hit you in the shower, you got to stand under the faucet, right? You got to stand under it. And if you want to experience all the blessings that God has for you, then we got to stand under it. We got, okay, Lord, I, not only do I believe you, but I'm going to put myself in a situation where I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe you. And you and I can have the assurance that whatever we lack today, God sees it and God wants to meet it. Don't be dismayed. Don't feel all all wrecked and all messed up because he is your God. Whatever fear is doing to separate you, to pull you apart, the Lord would say to you and me, let me hold you together. Let me be the thing that keeps you together. 
You know, we, like I said before, we honor those that are, are strong. We, we honor people that are courageous. And, and there's people in my life and there's people hopefully in your life who, man, they exemplify courage. I think of, there's some people in this church and there's some people in my life. I think of, I think of some of the single moms. Single moms who have raised kids. You are courageous. You are brave. We always want to talk about bravery like, you know, oh, you know, they did this or this. And no, bravery, it, I mean, or let's talk about we've got a lot of military families and we honor the, you know, the service member that goes out. But what about the spouse that stays home? You're a brave, courageous person. You're strong. You're strong. But that strength alone will not carry anyone. No, we have to discover that that real strength, that real courage as strong as you are, as courageous as you are, no one has enough courage to carry them through a lifetime. We must learn that it's okay to turn to the Lord and say, I'm not strong. I'm not strong enough. I'm not courageous enough. I'm not brave enough. I can't do this. These are not weaknesses. These are strengths. My acknowledgement of what I cannot do becomes an absolute strength because God will then meet me in the place of my transparency. You see, when I spend so much time trying to just be strong, I'm only tapping into what I have. But when I finally just kind of throw open the arms and say, God, I can't do it. I'm now inviting, Lord, I invite you. Lord, I can't stretch out my hand. I'm inviting you to call me to do that. And that's when the Lord says, let me be your God. Let me be for you and in you and through you and to you what you cannot be on your own. I look around this room and I think of those of you that are watching online that can't be here with us. You're strong. But it'll never be enough and that's okay. We must learn we must learn to fall back on the strength of God. It's not just a sweet little, listen, I think, you know, the cute little religious stuff all needs to die. We need to let all that stuff die. And we just got to be real, honest, down-to-earth Christians. Let all the rest of that stuff just pass away. And let us just be the honest to God, I just need you, Jesus, kind of a person. I'm not going to put up with all the, all the other things. I just need you. I need you to be strong in my life. And God will meet you. God will do what you can't do, nor what you were ever expected to do. The, the Bible here also says in, in verse 10, he says this, I will be your strength. And then he says this, I will be your help. You know what that means? When, when the Bible says, when God says, I want to be your help, he's saying this. Not only do I want to, I think sometimes, here's what I'm trying to say. Sometimes we're like, Lord, I'm up to here and I need more. And we think God just says, okay, let me give you a little bit more. But you know what it means when God says, I want to be your help? It means this. God's not looking to just give you barely enough so that you'll just be happy. Like just enough to get you by. The Lord is saying to you, I want to be your help. I want to help you. It's not a burden on God. When you're like, Lord, can you please give me more patience? The Lord's not like, really, really? You need more? Oh, Lord, I need more Lord, I, I, I don't have a job. I don't know what to do. I'm sorry that I'm asking you. You think the Lord's like, oh, I can't believe you're asking me. He wants to help you. Parents, you know what this is like. You know what it's like. You want to help your kids. You want to see them not just like get by, but you want to see them succeed. You want that for them. Do you think that you're a better parent than God? Don't answer that. I already know the answer to that one. In fact, Jesus himself said that. He says, he says, which of you would give a gift to your kids? And would I not give more? Would my Father in heaven not be give more to you? God wants to help you. This would be a great way for you and me to start 2021. Is the whole world going to change when January 1st, the clock ticks? No. But you know what can? We can learn today, and we can carry it into the new year. God really does want to help me. God wants to help me. It's not a burden on him. You're not burdening God with your problems or your issues. 
You know, we kind of start to burden people with those things, and so we think God's burdened as well. God's not burdened. God wants to help you. And then he says, and he finishes it with this. He says, I will uphold you with my right hand. And Jesus said something very similar in the New Testament when Jesus said this. He says, whoever is in my father's right hand will never be snatched away. And here's what I, I want to talk about this for just a couple minutes. I told you earlier, I think one of our biggest fears as Christians is the fear of ourselves. Like you realize, whatever somebody else might think of me, I know me. I know what I'm capable of, or even what scares me more is I don't know how, what I'm capable of. And it's a fear, and, 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 and you don't need to raise your hand. I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question, but I'll just say it in the form of a question, but you'll, 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 you don't need to raise, don't raise your hand, okay? How many of us are afraid of messing things up in our lives? You had to hold back from raising your hand. I think if we're honest, most of us would say amen. I know me to know I can mess. I've already done it many times. I can mess things up. I've messed up relationships. I've messed up friendships. I've done things that have hurt my kids rather than, and what I wanted to do was help them, but what I did was hurt them. I've done, I, and, and, look, and like I said, I'm just using myself as an example, but I know me, I know, and, and knowing me, I know you. We have done a lot of, we know our capacity to do damage. And what happens is I carry that into my thought process of my Christian life. And then I end up becoming the kind of Christian who lives my entire Christian life to try to not mess up. That becomes my Christianity. I don't want to mess up because I know that I can. And what that does to you and me is it actually does the exact opposite of what we were trying to do. I don't want to mess. I don't want to sin. I don't want to do this. I don't want to look at that. I don't want to think that. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to hurt this. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. And what you end up doing is you end up spending your entire Christian life so focused on not doing certain things that you never look up and see the beauty that's around you, that God created for you. You never enjoy the life that God wants to give you. We're so busy trying to not do the things we know we shouldn't do that we miss out on the whole thing of what maybe God wants to do. Again, as I said earlier, you know, I, like to, I still like to go out on runs, and if I spent my whole run just looking down trying to avoid, you know, there's so much, I mean, the sky and the, sometimes these beautiful clouds and the, and the sun and the, and the, I mean, it's just so much beauty around, but I can be so focused on don't trip on that, don't hit that, watch out for this, stay away from this. And, 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 I, and I can, I, you can run that way, you can focus that way, you can just do that. And then I get to the end, and I did it, but I had no joy. Now, let me be fair. In my run, I don't enjoy running anymore, either, even when I look around, so it's a bad analogy. It's like, there's a stupid tree and a stupid sun, and I hate it all now because I just don't like it. Uh, but you understand the analogy. You can spend your entire life like trying to, like, I don't want to sin here, and I don't want to sin here, and I don't want to do this, and I don't want to fall into this sin, and I don't want to, and then you never look up and just live the life that God wants you to live. You are being upheld right now by the strong right hand of God. Let me say it like this. You are not responsible for whether or not you're going to make it as a Christian. You're being held by the Lord. Are you capable of messing everything up? Oh, yes. Yes, you are. But listen, God is more capable of holding you than even you are of messing it all up. Don't ever underestimate your ability to mess things up. It's strong. God is more able to keep you than you are of messing things up. And I think we get so fixated on, I'm going to mess it up, I'm going to mess it up, I'm gonna, because we know us, we know us. But the thing about being a Christian, if you're going to attach that word to your life in any way at all, then you have to understand, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, what that means in the context that I'm trying to give it is this. You are not the first priority of your life anymore. It's Christ in you. 
You're so busy trying to not do the things that you shouldn't do. But really what Jesus is asking of you and me is, would you just trust me? Just look at me. Trust me. Let me live out that life in you and look up and enjoy. Live the life that I want you to have. Not just the one you're afraid of not having. We got to go for it. We got we to gotta look up. So the Bible constantly says in the Psalms, and we sing that Psalm, you know, um, I lift my eyes to the mountains from where my help comes from. We become, and the word is myopic and just closed and like, I don't want to do this and I don't want to do this. And anybody that's not living the way I'm living, something is wrong with them. They must be carnal. They must not be a real Christian because I'm so focused on not doing things that you shouldn't do. That's not a way to live a Christian life. If you want to change one thing in 2021, let it be this. Rather than being fixated upon what you shouldn't do, because the more you're fixated on what you shouldn't do, you know, don't look up, don't look up, don't look up, don't look up, don't look up. I, and then, okay, I'm not going to look up, I'm not going to look up. Now it's all you want to do. When we, when we focus on what we shouldn't do, it becomes the fixation. So let's change it. You ready? Look at Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Consider the life he wants you to have. Learn about what he has for you, not just what you shouldn't do. Trust him. This is the big message of fear. It's this. How do I fight fear? I got to trust the Lord. Wouldn't that be a great way? Listen, if you want to lose weight in 2021, go for it. But here's my suggestion. Add this one to your list of to-dos. Trust the Lord. I know, we do, we all trust the Lord. But in action, in motion, while you're, at, while, you're, while you're feeling that, you know, disarray of life, when you're feeling alone, when fears begin to become anger, trust the Lord. Don't just try it, but do it. Oh, I can't, it's so hard. If God asks you to do something, he will give you the power to do it. And he says... Do not be afraid, which means we can live that way. We can, we can trust God as we enter into 2021. And I want to put this, and I'll finish with just very practical ideas here. We can become so focused on what we shouldn't be doing that we miss out on the relationships that God wants us to have in our lives. Or I shouldn't. I can't be friends with that person because they're not at my level, whatever that is. They're struggling. They're doing this or whatever. We have, all of us, if we would just be honest, like there are so many relationships in our lives right now that would benefit from you and I not being afraid. And here's what it looks like. For, for a lot of us Christians, here's what fear looks like in our relationships. I don't want to be too open because I wouldn't want them to get the bad, a bad impression of me. And the very thing that you're not wanting them to get is exactly what happens most of the time. Because we can read through people holding back, trying to make us show the good side only. I'm not saying spill your guts to every human being around you. Please don't do that. But there's people in your lives who will benefit from you just being you. You trusting God. You being you rather than you trying to impress them by your super Christian which we can all see through. Wouldn't 2021, wouldn't it be great to like live the rest of your life the way you do when you go home? Kick off your shoes and relax and not have to impress everybody and be all that all the time? Wouldn't that be amazing? Now again, like I said, you know, you, you haven't met this person. You're like, how are you? Terrible. Let me tell you. Sit down. Let me tell you how terrible my life is. You don't have to do that. Save that for therapy, okay? Uh, but be honest. Be transparent. Be free to be you. Be free to be you. Oh, but I have such a long way to go. Exactly. Let people in on that. They already know it. Ain't nobody fooled when they're like, you know, oh, wow, that guy is an amazing, that person never sins. Nobody believes that. We're all a mess. We just have different levels of Jesus in our mess. Let people in. It's okay. You're, in fact, and I'll finish with this. I've said three times, but this is a real one. 
One of the greatest compliments that was ever paid a human being in the New Testament was when Jesus first met Nathan. And he, he, Jesus meets Nathan and he says, oh, I know about you. I saw you when you were sitting under the tree. And then Nathan kind of says a few things. And Jesus says this about Nathan. It's a, it's, I think if this could be said of each one of us, it would, be a, it would be amazing. He says this, this is a man in whom there is no guile. You know what that means? It means this, like this is a transparent, honest This is, what you see is what you're getting with Nathan. Not all hard and cynical. Sometimes we we translate honesty with cynicism. How are you doing? I'm doing terrible. That's not honesty, it's cynicism. Cynicism is not transparency. Because if you're in Christ, then you have the hope of heaven. You have the rock of ages, the way the Bible describes Jesus. You are not alone. You have a God who wants to help you. So cynicism is actually a lack of faith. Real honesty says, I'm hurting, but God is on the throne. I'm wrestling, but God is real. I'm working, but God is, God is also working. Whatever, whatever it would look like. A man in whom there is no guile is not a cynical, skeptical, pessimistic person. It's a person who's like, he's just free from all the fears of, you know, like, Nathan was a man who, he still wrestled with fear, but, but, but this fear he was not, he was not wrestling with. He was a man with no guile. And Jesus looked at him and said, man, I, I love, I love where you're at. I love that about you. Don't be afraid that, that, that if you were to let people see who you really are, that they're not going to love Jesus because of that. It might be the exact opposite. You letting that go might be the very thing that helps them to go, wow, that guy's a lot more like me than I realized. I thought they were out of reach. They're not. They're just like me. And in whom a man, a man in whom there is no guile. It's a great thing. I really encourage you for 2021, if you're going to pick up a new habit, it's this. Trust the Lord. And it sounds way easier than it is to do. But it would be a great place for you and me to start. Let's trust the Lord. Let's trust the Lord in 2021. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thanks for the chance to get to talk about fear and what you have to say about fear. Bless this group here, Lord, those online, those here in person. Lord, we want our lives to be to your glory. And sometimes, Lord, that doesn't look like our best. Sometimes what brings you glory, Lord, is the fact that we've needed your grace. We've needed your forgiveness. And that ministers, Lord, that that ministers in a big way to people. Bless, Lord. I pray for those that are hurting, those that are struggling in fear right now. They shouldn't feel ashamed, Lord. They shouldn't feel belittled like they're less than a Christian because the truth is, is God, is none of us have enough strength in our own. We need you. None of it. Lord, as, as natural as fear is, the solution is supernatural. It's outside of our own means. I pray that you would be strong in our lives, God. Bless, Lord. Bless, bless, bless people, Lord. Help us to begin to live real. There's that, that, the realness. The realness and the rawness of what it means to be a Christian. In Jesus' name, amen.